On September 15, 2019, Alicia Navarro vanished from their Glendale, Arizona home. At the time, Alicia's mother, Jessica Nunez, expressed her increased fear for her daughter's safety due to the quick global spread of the pandemic. Jessica sobbed, We just need to find her, and I need to know that she is safe. Without me, my girl is out there by herself. And now this virus. How awful is it? All I want is her to come home. According to Jessica, she is particularly concerned because her daughter is autistic and has a history of social anxiety and shyness. She has a weakened immune system and takes medication. Jessica worries that given the current circumstances, Alicia's anxiousness will also get the better of her. The last time Jessica saw her daughter was in the wee hours of September 15, 2019. Jessica was waiting for her husband to get off work at approximately 1 in the morning. After getting a glass of water, Alicia went back to her room. Jessica stated that she had a strong interest in gaming. She used to stay up late chatting with pals and playing games on the internet. I assumed it was safe, so I didn't give it much thought. Around 7 in the morning, Jessica prepared breakfast for her spouse and the two youngest children who happened to be Alicia's younger brother and sister. Alicia hadn't risen yet. Jessica realized the rear door was open at that point. Upon inspecting the backyard, she found a few seats near a wall on the boundary of their space. Jessica felt her heart sink when she realized that Alicia was using them to scale the wall. She went through her daughter's room. Alicia had left. Soon after, Jessica discovered a note on Alicia's desk that said, I ran away. I promise that I will return. I apologize. Alicia's laptop was missing as well. However, the chargers were still in her room. Jessica called the police right away, telling Dateline that this was out of character for Alicia. Although she was really concerned, she told Dateline she thought the teen would return in a few days. Jessica stated that the six-month mark has now passed. Where is she? Her mother says that Alicia isn't a very in-demand girl. She enjoys wearing the same pair of shoes and outfits repeatedly, which her mother says is because of her autism. Even in Arizona, with its intense heat, she wore only sweaters. Alicia didn't enjoy spending a lot of time or going out in public. Nonetheless, she enjoyed visiting McDonald's, as her mother claimed she had been eating chicken nuggets there for years. She had been attending Brigade Catholic High School for a few days now, and her anxiousness had been at its highest. Still, Jessica claimed her daughter never complained about being at home. She adores her family and is a sweet girl. According to Jessica, she also enjoys reading and playing video games, adding that her absence might have been caused by her online gaming. Jessica expressed her concern that she might have been drawn away by an online predator from one of Alicia's games. All I can think is that she's in danger. Jessica claimed that if she hadn't been in contact with me, she never would have left this long. I'm really concerned that someone has her. Jessica stated that finding her daughter is her first priority. Her second objective is to caution parents about keeping an eye on their kids' online and social media activity. According to Jessica, it might be the difference between your child's life and death. Kindly keep an eye on whatever they do. I wish for no one to experience the same nightmare that I am. Datelane was informed by the Glendale Police Department. They are still looking for Alicia and have stated that they could use the public's assistance if they learn anything new. It is unknown at this point if Alicia was lured away or if she departed on her own. Investigators have been working nonstop to get Alicia home as soon as possible and safely, Glendale Police Sergeant Randy Stewart told Dateline. She would have to rely on others because she had no known way to support herself and living on the streets can be extremely dangerous. Because of her short stature and autism, Alicia may appear younger, according to both her family and the police. Stewart continued, Alicia's age, stature, and autism make her more vulnerable to exploitation the longer she is away from home. The FBI, the Center for Missing and Exploited Children, and the Glendale Police Department are currently collaborating on the case. In Arizona, a silver alert has been issued and authorities are still investigating any leads and information they receive. For those interested in discussing Alicia Navarro's case or providing information, 
that could lead to her location. A Facebook page named Finding Alicia Navarro has been formed. Jessica remarked, I still have hope that my Alicia will be found. Even though it's extremely difficult, I must never give up hope. I implore you to notify someone if you have seen her. All I can hope for is that this nightmare ends soon. On September 20, 2019, Alicia turned 15. She has brown hair, brown eyes, and braces. She is 95 pounds and perhaps four or five feet tall in length. She might be carrying a silver Apple MacBook Pro laptop and dressed in a black and white van style sneaker, skirt, and whitewashed denim overalls. July 2023 marked the conclusion of the search for 14-year-old Alicia Navarro, who vanished from the Phoenix region in September of 2019 when the 18-year-old girl showed up at a Montana police station. By all accounts, she is secure. Jose Santiago, a representative for the Glendale Police Department, informed reporters during a press conference that she is, by all accounts, in good condition and is content. The circumstances surrounding Alicia's travel to Montana are still unknown, and the matter is currently being investigated. It was confirmed by the police that no one has been taken into custody or arrested in relation to the case. A search warrant was served at the residence, and four people were interviewed. No further details were disclosed. Officer Gina Wynn of the Glendale Police Department stated, This is still an active investigation, and we are requesting time and patience as we peel away the layers of the last four years. As stated by Jessica Nunez, Alicia's mother, miracles do happen, and always hope and always fight. Haver, Montana, a town close to the U.S.-Canada border, according to the police. When Alicia entered the town's police station, she declared her desire to be removed from the list of missing people. Trent Steele, the president of the Anti-Predator Project, stated that Alicia requested her identification and other paperwork. On July 26, Nunez and Alicia had a video call. But there are still unanswered questions about Alicia's activities after her disappearance in 2019. According to Steele, there are still a lot of moving bits and moving parts. I believe that information will most likely keep coming out over the coming days, weeks, months, and possibly years. We had a conversation with Jeffrey Hummer on July 28. He claimed to have encountered Alicia in June 2022 and claimed to have recognized her from the headlines. Hummer remarked, It was like a light bulb went on in my head. The gears all turned and the pieces all began to fit together again. Hummer claimed that he saw the teenager when he was in a city park working on a project. She was primarily sitting in the gaze bow, but I didn't speak to her or do anything of the such, Hummer claimed. Alicia wore a blue jacket with black clothes. There she ate lunch by herself while sitting alone and then left with a plastic Walmart bag. Now that she has been reunited with her mother, the family had requested for privacy. With that said, we won't be disclosing any specifics about the reunion. This is the tale of Donna Macho, a 19-year-old legal secretary who also works as a part-time model. Donna was well-liked in both high school and college, and is said to be stunning. She lived in East Windsor, New Jersey, at the Cherry Brook Lane home. Donna was a very motivated individual who wanted to become a supermodel and worked extremely hard to make her part-time modeling profession her full-time career. For 14-year-old Julie Macho, it appeared to be just another Saturday night in 1984. After seeing her 19-year-old sister Donna's automobile parked outside her family's East Windsor house, she proceeded to the basement to spend time with her older sibling. After spending hours watching horror films, Julie went upstairs to bed on Cherry Brook Lane around 2 in the morning. That was the final time Donna Macho's family members saw her alive. Upstairs, their stepfather Garland and mother Betty were fast sleeping. Berger claimed that she never heard noise coming from the flat in the basement. Berger is still unaware of what transpired that evening. Only that the next morning, on February 26, 1984, marked the start of a 10-year nightmare when they sensed that something was awry because Macho had vanished. Uncertainty can be so damaging, stated Berger, 
considering the crime that not only claimed her sister's life, but also her mother, stepfather, and elder sister, Tony. My family was ruined by it. The looking, the roaming, the searching. I lost both my family and my future. About a mile away, investigators immediately discovered Macho's blood-stained automobile. However, it took 11 torturous years for her skeletal remains to be found in April 1995, covered in a carpet in a forested area close to a cranberry farm, not far from the location where the vehicle was found. Regarding the family's search for the murderer, Berger said, we hired trackers, psychics, private investigators. All of our money was wasted. We continued to believe that perhaps she was still alive. Perhaps there was someone holding her, or maybe she was just hurt. After nearly 40 years of mystery, New Jersey officials finally identified her killer in May of this year. A convicted murderer named Nathaniel Harvey, who served time on New Jersey's death row and passed away in prison three years ago, was identified through advanced DNA analysis of semen discovered in Donna Macho's cellar. Berger received a call about the DNA match months ago. Harvey was officially identified as her sister's murderer, according to Matthew Norton an investigator with the Mercer County Prosecutor's Office. She added that after all these years, being able to put the question behind her gave her a small amount of closure. But anger soon followed. It was going to be closed, which relieved me. But I was furious, said Berger. I was upset that I left her to fight on her own. I was mad that how effortlessly he could break into our houses. Mad that he wasn't in prison. He was dead and he never had to pay for any of it. Harvey had been locked up since 1985. The 37-year-old Plainsboro woman Irene Schnapps was sexually assaulted and then murdered one year after Macho's death. There were other suspicions, too, but Harvey had been questioned by police several times over the years as they looked into the Macho murderer. Moreover, Harvey's DNA testing from the 1980s and 1990s had yielded conflicting results. Attorney Eric Kleiner for Harvey has always maintained that his client did not commit any murders. And when Harvey passed away in prison in November 2020, he was still contesting his conviction in the Schnapps murder. In the Schnapp case, Harvey went on trial in 1986 and was found guilty of both rape and murder. Harvey argued on appeal that he was never informed of his Miranda rights after being questioned by the police. The conviction was overturned by the Supreme Court of New Jersey. Harvey was put on trial once more in 1994, found guilty, and given the death penalty. He filed his appeal once more after New Jersey abolished the death sentence in 2007. After a while, the matter was heard by the state Supreme Court, which mandated additional DNA testing. Harvey also prevailed in 2015 to be granted a third trial on the murder of Schnapps. At the age of 70, he passed away while awaiting that trial. Kleiner stated that he was unable to comment this week since he had not seen the findings of the DNA test. Berger, on the other hand, expressed her relief at the eventual identification of her sister's murderer. During the time that Macho vanished, Harvey was a resident of East Windsor. According to authority, he was employed at the property where Macho's body was discovered. His DNA is there, she said when all is said and done. She also mentioned that since Harvey had long been suspected, there's no way anyone else could have done it. He did it if the DNA is found in our home. Many unanswered questions surround that fatal night. Was he in the house the whole time? How did he enter? She said, I just don't know. What haunts her most, she said, is her belief that she could have stopped the killer. Berger claimed that on Sunday, her sister vanished from her job at a law business. Thus, it was not shocking when she disappeared from the house throughout the day. However, her mother became concerned when she failed to return home for supper and went downstairs to inspect the flat. Berger noted that there were items scattered throughout Donna's usually clean flat, giving away that there had been a struggle. Her mother phoned the police after discovering a pile of garments soaked with blood. Berger claimed that the family suffered immediate effects from the trauma. Six months after Donna vanished, her stepfather passed away. In 1987, she and her mother moved to Texas. However, their storage facility was quickly broken into, and everything they owned, including family portraits, souvenirs, 
and 16 boxes of data pertaining to the investigation, was taken. Her mom passed away in 1990, and a few years later, her elder sister Tony passed away. Before Donna's body was found, they passed away. Berger stated that the only thing worse than dying is a child going missing. There is no moving forward when your child is missing. Berger claimed that she made a promise to her mother on her deathbed to continue working the case. She also attempted to get in touch with Harvey through his lawyer in the latter part of the 1990s. I said, let me talk to him, but he wouldn't let me do that. Berger claimed that despite constantly expecting a development in the case, she eventually rebuilt her life in Texas, got married, and raised three children. At the age of 54, she is a grandma and a council member for the town of New Fairview, where she currently resides. Berger stated that she will follow up with New Jersey law enforcement on a regular basis to inquire about any updates on the matter. In order to keep the investigation going, she has also maintained contact with residents of East Windsor via the Heightstown High Memorial page on Facebook. It's good that the case is over. She stated that it was him. However, I think he got away with it. Berger was able to get her sister's remains at last once the investigation was concluded. Now she could bury her sister in the family niche the right way. Vicki Johnson's body was discovered by detectives in January 1991 at a park on Darwin Street in H Place in Seaside. She was strangled, according to the police, and her body was burned. Since there were no witnesses to the crime, there were no leads on a suspect. The case remained unresolved for over 32 years until a DNA match to a man known as Frank Lewis McClure was discovered under Johnson's fingernails by the State Department of Justice Crime Laboratory. 34 years old Vicki Johnson, the victim, fought back and got Frank Lewis McClure's DNA beneath her fingernails. Although it is too late to accuse the suspect because McClure passed away in 2021 at the age of 77. It is nevertheless an answer. Johnson, a mother of three, was discovered dead on January 3, 1991, amid a horrifying scene in Sabato Park's playground area. Seaside is around 115 miles south of San Francisco, directly east of Monterey. Miss Johnson died violently. She had been burned, choked, and smothered. The tales of Miss Johnson's savagery stunned the beachside community when she passed away. There was a lot of gang violence back then, but this one took everyone by surprise. Nick Borges, the head of police at Seaside, told Fox News she had no gang affiliation. Thus, it was unfair that she was slain in this manner. He claimed that at the time, the crack epidemic in this area was ridiculous. Up until the early 2000s, the only dealers in the area were from the beach. It is not like that anymore, according to Borges. But he pointed out the grim heritage of the city. It was a violent neighborhood. He claimed that there was a belief at the time that the victims of murder were not particularly important. And that's unacceptable in my opinion. Every life counts, and we must treat everyone fairly. The case was revisited by investigators working with the Monterey County District Attorney's Office-led Cold Case Task Group. They sent more evidence for DNA testing to the California Department of Justice. Due to staffing shortages and backlogs, testing took two years, according to Borges. It's very depressing. It relates to my general dissatisfaction with cold cases. He expressed his displeasure with the case's poor progress. He pointed out that the question DNA technology is not brand new. In August 2021, he was appointed chief. It was possible to conduct similar testing 10 years ago, he continued. He admitted that the sheer volume of new cases overwhelms agencies. However, he pointed out that there was no national standard in place for the periodic examination of unsolved homicides. He recommended passing laws. He remarked, we can never allow murderers to fall off. After obtaining information about Johnson's death, investigators named McClure as the prime suspect. Borges stated that the DNA found under Johnson's fingernails helped them identify the culprit. Evidence unequivocally shows that Mrs. Johnson fought McClure until the very end of her life, putting up an amazing physical fight. 
significant DNA was found by McClure under Mrs. Johnson's fingernails, which could only indicate that Mrs. Johnson fought valiantly for her life. According to the chief, McClure's criminal history extends back to 1990 and includes offenses including violence, causing serious bodily injury, and resisting police. The suspect was given a four-year jail sentence for violating probation in 1994 by committing domestic abuse and assault with a lethal weapon. Domestic abuse and assault with a deadly weapon were perpetrated by McClure in 1991, the year of the murder. In fact, the chief stated that domestic abuse cases were his most frequent charges. He cited incidences ranging from 1990 to 2011, including the 1991 case described earlier, 94-99, and the most recent, in 2011. He served time in prison for assaults against women using lethal weapons and domestic abuse. However, nothing emerged that may have warned us that this man might be planning a murder. According to what Borges told Fox, he wasn't exactly a fantastic person, but he was widely known in the neighborhood. However, his family was well-known so nobody was all that shocked. How Johnson and McClure knew one another, or even whether they did at all, is still a mystery. The motivation is also unknown to the officers. That, remarked Borges, is the puzzle here. Given the small size of Seaside, Borges hypothesized, there's a good chance the murderer and victim knew one another at least somewhat. He remarked that the only true connection between them was that they had experimented with illegal drugs. It's quite challenging since we might never find out because he's deceased. However, the inquiry is still going on. Borges expressed optimism that the truth will be revealed by someone who knew McClure. He must have told someone about what he did, and maybe that someone will come forward. After DNA evidence linked a long-term suspect to a 1993 cold case murder, Florida authorities have stated, they may now officially conclude the investigation. At the age of 23, Rosalind Cruz was last saw getting into an unidentified person's car on November 1, 1993. Her body was found soon afterwards, with an autopsy, on the east side of East Bay Road in Gibsonton, Florida, approximately 10 miles south of the city center. Then it was revealed that she had been killed by strangulation. Upon tracing the car to a Tampa house, it appeared that the investigators were swiftly making progress. Furthermore, a man going by the name of Michael Rizzo acknowledged that he had picked Rosalind up in his car the day before she passed away, despite his constant claims that she was still alive when he left her. Regrettably, however, there was no tangible evidence linking Rizzo to the victim, besides the fact that the deposition location was less than a mile from his house. He failed a polygraph test, and his girlfriend provided an inconsistent account to support his alibi. Despite the fact that the preliminary inquiry revealed he had picked her up the day before the murder, Rizzo denied any role in Cruz's demise and insisted that he had dropped her off alive. Additionally, contradicting evidence from Rizzo's wife and girlfriend at the time hindered the investigation, even though a polygraph exam conducted at the time revealed deceit in his responses, the sheriff claimed. The case eventually became cold since investigators were unable to corroborate their allegations in spite of all the circumstantial evidence. Up until November 2021, investigators gathered and preserved forensic evidence relevant to the case, including an unidentified DNA sample taken from Cruz's body at the time that produced no matches. Investigators obtained a DNA sample from Rizzo's biological daughter at the time, and it matched the DNA profile extracted from Cruz's corpse. After finding that the discovery provided a crucial lead in the investigation, detectives from the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office spoke with Cruz's relatives. Without ever confessing to his crimes, investigators were able to confirm that Rizzo passed away in Orange County, Florida on March 1, 2011. Sheriff Chad Cronister stated, This investigation shows the commitment of our cold case investigators to bring justice to victims and their families no matter how much time has passed. We hope that the outcome of this case will bring the family of Miss Cruz some sense of closure. Our centrist condolences go out to them. The Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office has formally concluded the inquiry. 
Convicted in 2022, the 76-year-old serial killer is receiving a life sentence for killing almost six women and girls in New Jersey and New York throughout the 1960s and 1970s. Over 50 years ago, he killed a woman by strangulation in a Nassau County Moore parking lot. He then admitted to four additional killings. Cusick, a dance instructor and single mother, was 23 years old. Cusick's father discovered her battered, sexually assaulted, and covered in duct tape in the back seat of her car in the mall parking lot after her parents filed a missing persons report after she did not come home. Two days after Valentine's Day that year, Richard Cottingham, 73 years old, also known as the Torso Killer or Times Square Killer, entered a guilty plea in 2022 for the 1968 murder of Long Island single mother Diane Cusick. He also admitted to four more unsolved murders from the 1970s. Cottingham claims to have killed up to 100 people in New York and New Jersey. These include the murders of Mary Beth Hines and Laverne Mee Moyer in May and July of 1972, as well as the murders of Sheila Hyman and Maria Emerita Rosado Nieves in the 1970s. He won't face additional charges in connection with these killings, but as part of the plea agreement, a 25-year sentence will be added to his existing life sentence. After killing around a dozen women and girls in the 1960s, Richard was given a life term in a state prison in New Jersey. Before attacking them violently, he apparently frequently pretended to be a mall security guard and approached victims in parking lots, accusing them of theft. Cottingham, a former Manhattan computer programmer and father of three, was granted immunity from prosecution for the four additional crimes as part of a plea agreement. He has claimed to be accountable for up to 100 fatalities. Even still, only a dozen people have been formally connected to him by New York and New Jersey authorities thus far. He has been behind bars since 1980, when he was taken into custody following the discovery of a woman crying in his room by a hotel. The woman was discovered by the authorities shackled with bite and knife wounds, but otherwise alive. After Cottingham, posing as an officer, accused the 98-pound woman of stealing, he then subdued her, the police believed. Cusick had suffered head and facial injuries, as well as suffocation, according to the medical examiner's findings. She had defensive wounds on her hands, and DNA evidence could be obtained at the spot by the police, but DNA testing was non-existent at the time. The NCDA and our partners at the Nassau County Police Department were only able to solve this 54-year-old cold case and identify a suspect in the tragic death of Mrs. Cusick thanks to advancements in DNA testing. In June 2022, Nassau County District Attorney Ann Donnelly declared, We make a promise to her surviving daughter today announcing the indictment. We're going to hold her mother's killer accountable. The statement I never thought I would see this day, but all these people got justice for my mum, was made by Cusick's daughter, Darlene Altman. Seeing him look blankly at the camera in court was depressing. In the early 1980s, he was found guilty of the murders of five women, two in Bergen County, New Jersey, and three in New York. He is said to have admitted in 2010, to killing a different woman in northern New Jersey in 1967. In 2021, Cottingham entered a guilty plea for the 1974 killings of two teenagers from New Jersey, Mary Ann Pryor, age 17, and Lorraine Marie Kelly, age 16, who were pals and had gone to the mall to buy new swimmer but never came back. Their remains were discovered beaten and nude in the northern New Jersey woods, five days after they went missing. Because he was accused of dismembering victims in certain instances, he was nicknamed the Torso Killer. He beheaded and severed the hands of two suspected sex workers on December 1, 1979, in a Times Square hotel, and then set the room on fire. If you find this video compelling, show your support by giving it a thumbs up subscribing to our channel 
and ringing that notification bell. By doing so, you'll stay updated on our latest investigations and mysteries. Your support means the world to us as we continue to pursue the truth in the world of unsolved cases.